Gen 357, PA House Bill 357. I think it has over 10,000 likes the last I saw it. So if you're on Facebook, you might want to go like that or catch up with me on Facebook and uh, see what I'm doing. Um, but uh, House Bill 357, we introduced to stop federal future gun control measures. And I can't take, I can't take credit for thinking of it originally um, because I was modeling it after what some of my colleagues were doing in other states. We saw Wyoming and other states that were putting that legislation forward, and a couple of my staff keyed in on it and brought it to my attention. And I said, let's get something drafted. Um, ours is stronger than some of those in that if somebody tries to come into Pennsylvania and enforce any future gun control measures as of the end of last year, any future federal gun control measures, if they would try and enforce those, I want to hit them with a felony charge. And I want to make New York City Mayor Bloomberg's new Attorney General, Kathleen Kane, have to intercede on our behalf to protect us from it. So we instruct her in it to do so. But it's important that there is no more future federal gun control measures because they've already went too far, haven't they? They've crossed the line already. We need to push them back over the line and regain our freedom, not allow them to take another step forward. And that's what I, the message I tried to deliver to my friend Pat Toomey, who I supported in both campaigns originally. The first one, I was one of the first legislators at the state level to stick my head out there. I was one of the first state legislators put on the Arlen Specter enemy list. And I've had myself out there for Pat from the beginning and, and took a lot of arrows for him because of it. And I sent a letter to Pat with 75 of my colleagues prior to his announcing his deal with Senator Manchin out of West Virginia. And I... And we asked him, 76 of us, all Republicans, out of the House of Representatives, who all signed that letter within a day of me asking them, and got it hand-delivered to Pat Toomey's office. As one, he sent one of his staff to my office at the Capitol in Harrisburg to pick it up. So he knew before he announced his deal that we were opposed to any future federal gun control. And he did it anyhow. And then the next day, he asked for a conference call with many of us. And I went on a conference call with Pat and I was one of the first state legislators to address him during a conference call after he got done giving us his spiel on why he did it. And, and I laid out some of the same statistics that I have for you here tonight. And I said, this is, this is not something that uh, should be supported. And it's something that I respectfully asked him to do is uphold your oath of office and break your handshake agreement with the liberal Democrats. Because a handshake is not as superior as an oath to the Constitution. Pat agreed to disagree with me at the end of our conversation. And of course, he went his way to continue to defend that and ultimately vote for it as it went down in flames, which was another victory for us. <laughs> Steve had mentioned the uh, Pennsylvania Leadership Conference, which Pat addressed on Friday a week or so ago. And at that conference, he admitted that he'd lost and that he was going to get back to his wheelhouse of fiscal issues, which is good. But everybody who is in elected office, they all have the wheelhouse of the Constitution. So you're not allowed a pass when you try and violate the Constitution. I want to hear from Pat as an apology. I don't want to hear I lost. You lost because you were wrong. Now it's time to apologize. Say you won't do it again. And then let's move forward. Because everybody can make mistakes, but learn from them. And don't do it again. So I was meeting with Steve and, and a few other folks that are here tonight uh, earlier this evening and talking about grassroots efforts, which this whole organization is about. And we will not be successful in Harrisburg in defending your freedom unless you work aggressively at the grassroots level. And I can point to two, two different projects, if you call it, that, that occurred over the years. One is Abate. Who's familiar with Abate? Bikers, bikers organization? They have a very strong presence at the state capitol, and they have ever since I came. When I first ran for office in 1998, I got a survey in the mail from a motorcycle organization called Abate. And as a motorcyclist, I don't have one any longer. I haven't been able to afford one while I was paying for my daughter's college. and Don't have a garage to put it in because we stayed in the same house to pay for my daughter's college, <laughs> which I've let my daughter know a couple times, but... Uh, but she's taken in good nature. My wife doesn't want me on a bike anyhow. But, uh, 
but I, I have intent. I'm in, I have intentions of getting one in the future, so I've kept it valid on my on my uh, on my license all these years, even though I haven't been able to afford one. Um, so I'm intending to get back on one again. But I got the motorcycle a survey in the mail, and I thought, oh, I enjoy motorcycles. I've had my motorcycle license. I used to have a motorcycle. I'm going to answer this survey. I sent it back, and back comes to me. I think it was a check for $250, which shocked me that they contributed to my campaign $250, a motorcyclist group that raises money and backs candidates that support their issues. That's on one issue on motorcyclist type initiatives, which I found to be you know, really shocking, but I was happy until I found out they gave my opponent 300. <laughs> but I was with them because of the issues, not because of what they contributed. So after I got elected and I beat the guy they gave $300 to, then uh, I learned that they were very active at the Capitol. And they have an annual rally. They'll show up in the rotunda, have 100, 200, 300 bikers that will show up in their leather on their motorcycles, walking the hallways, talking to legislators about their issues every year. And when I came in the legislature, the helmet repeal was one of their big issues. Now, what kind of sense does it make that we repealed the law to wear a helmet at the same time as if you drive a car, you have to wear a seatbelt? That, make, that makes no sense. That is not logical. And the only reason it occurred was because motorcyclists have joined together, created a grassroots campaign, and have been aggressive and active in that campaign for many, many years, and they repealed that helmet law with their grassroots activism with the help of many of us inside. I voted to repeal that, as I would vote to repeal the seatbelt law, because I think the government has no right to tell me either. <laughs> the other example I'll give you is a 2005 state pay raise across all three branches of government, the judiciary, executive, and legislative. It was focused on the legislative because we're the ones that passed it. Governor Ridge signed it. No, he signed the pension increase. Governor Rendell signed the pay raise. I had to give him credit for who, who, took, take, who needs to take credit. So when you hear Governor Ridge talking about what he thinks we should do, remember, he's the one that helped put us in the pension situation we're in with his signing that bill back in 2001. So Democrats and Republicans have both screwed up like that over the years. So Rendell signed the pay raise um, advance for all three branches of government. Within six months, the legislature repealed a self-serving piece of legislation. And you know why we did that? We did that because of people like you calling talk shows, emailing, answering surveys, knocking on doors, showing up at capital offices, showing up at district offices, demanding that we repeal that unconstitutional pay raise that we passed. I voted against it originally. I was the leader of the repeal inside with one of my colleagues that put in the, re the repeal piece of legislation. I was a real thorn in leadership side until they finally decided to run it. And when they ran it, only one person in the House voted against it even though the majority had voted for it six months prior, and it was filling their own pocket. So how do you do something that fills somebody's pocket and get them to repeal that at the same time? It was grassroots, my friends, grassroots efforts. And that's what your work can do. Steve talked about retaking our country. We can retake our country. From, from many people's perspective after November, I think many people aren't, that aren't here tonight, and some of you that are here tonight, were so discouraged by what happened in November, you thought, how are we going to survive the next four years and how do we leave a land of freedom to our next generation? But we can, because it's America. And we still have the ability to regain our freedom politically. Because you only hold on to freedom one of two ways. Either politi with political might or military might. I, th I really, as a veteran, military might appeals to me. Because it's a lot faster. <laughs> and I was trained that way. <clears throat> but what I'm talking about now is not using military might. It's using political might. And that's what I've been talking about across the state because we've been blessed by God to be in a nation, in a state, in a community, in townships and counties and boroughs and cities where we have the ability under the Constitution to use political might and regain our freedom and throw the bums out, as some say. And if you can't throw them out, scare them that they're going to be thrown out and they'll come your way many times. So we have to work to regain our freedom and do it politically. And all of you here tonight need to embrace that duty as a citizen to become more active, to, incur to educate your neighbors and your friends and your family, your fellow church members, your fellow, fellow workers, to get them active, to help them to understand that if they want to pass on freedom to the next generation, they're going to have to become active. And that's what many of us are doing this for is to make sure that it's there for our kids and our grandkids and our great-grandkids, right? 
Because as you, as you approach the mid-years and the latter years of your life, it's not about you anymore and what you're fighting for because you don't have that many more years to enjoy it, right? It's about passing something on and doing what's beneficial for our fellow citizens. And we need more citizens to do that, and we need the youth to do it, and we need the elderly to do it, and we need those that are middle-aged to do it. We need all citizens to do that. And what I would encourage you to do tonight, even though some of you might not be a veteran, might not have served in office where you've sworn to pull and defend the Constitution, you don't have to to embrace that duty as a patriotic American to uphold and defend your, my Constitution. Because every American that's patriotic should embrace the oath to uphold and defend the Constitution. And if you leave here tonight with that renewed, with that renewed commitment, then we can retake America, and we can pass it on in the next generation as it should be passed on, land of the free and home of the brave. I'd be happy to do whatever questions Steve has time for. Yes, sir. House Bill 357. Right now we have 72 Republican co-sponsors, four Democrat co-sponsors, so we need more Democrats on. And I need more Republicans, especially Southeast Republicans, because I don't have a lot of them. Paul Clymer is a co-sponsor. Um, Steve Barrar is a co-sponsor out of Delaware County. John Lawrence is a co-sponsor out of Chester County but uh, not too many others. There might be a couple that I might have missed, but we don't have too many. So we need, in order to pass something on a floor in a house, you need 102 votes when you have 203 members. Right now we're down to like 200, 202 members, 201 members, I think. Right? We have a couple special elections we have to see, fill some seats that will happen in a primary. So right now we need 101 votes passed on a floor. So I want to see 102 co-sponsors on the bill before I ask for them to move it out of committee. Um, I'd like the Judiciary Committee to move it out of that committee and give it to my committee because the chairman of the judiciary, Republican, um, isn't in favor of moving the bill at all um, because he believes it violates the Supremacy Clause, which you'll hear is an excuse from some legislators. It doesn't violate the Supremacy Clause. The Supremacy Clause is a section of the U.S. Constitution that basically says if there's a state law and there's a federal law, federal law is supreme because the feds reign over state laws. But it's only in regards to the limited powers that we've given to the federal government. So if the federal government violates the federal constitution to begin with or violates our state constitution, they can't claim supremacy. It's not logical. So the supremacy clause doesn't wash. And uh, he's, he shouldn't be allowed to use that. He is. But I've told him, hey, you don't want to run it? Send it to me. We'll put it in my committee. We'll gain the co-sponsors. I'll talk to leadership. We'll move it when we have the votes to pass it. Yes, ma'am. Right. House Bill 357. Right, Judiciary Committee. Well, he has two attorneys that work on his committee, and I had two attorneys there that work for leadership, and we, we discussed it, and I laid out my arguments, and his attorneys didn't have a whole lot to say back. He didn't have a whole lot to say back. We talked, but, you know, he's kind of taken that supremacy clause stand and hasn't really backed down from it. Um, I know he's been sent a letter by the Tenth Amendment Center laying out the, the, the correct argument to him on why he shouldn't embrace that argument. But he's an attorney also. And I think attorneys that are in the legislature have a conflict because they're licensed to practice law and the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania can affect that license. So if you're serving in the legislature and you're passing something that the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania doesn't want you to pass, then they, there's some leverage created there, whether it's real or perceived, that uh, might work against a legislator doing what's right for the people because of a threat from the court. So another reason we need to impeach more judges, because we need to show judges they're not above the law. Gentleman over here with a hat. You can speak up, speak up, sir. Yes, sir. Well, the PIC system, system works sometimes. It depends on whether they're down for maintenance or whether they're down during a gun show or, 
I mean, I've been in, I've purchased some firearms when the PIC, I mean, the PIC system's used for every one of you. Every one of you, when you've purchased a firearm retail in Pennsylvania, you've been put through the PICs. So if you had an easy time, PIC system worked from that opinion or that standpoint. But if you've been one of the individuals that showed up at a gun show and all of a sudden PICs is down, or you showed up at a, gu at a gun shop and, and they've got 20 minutes, they're on hold waiting for an operator um, to actually give them the right authorization, and people are walking out the door because they don't have time to wait to make the purchase because the line's too long now because of the PICs being slowed down. So the PICs works. Oh, you, you're saying it's, he stopped somebody. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, well, that's what the Knicks would have done the same thing. Yeah, it's amazing how fast electrons move nowadays, though. <laughs> you can make a phone call as quick from Harrisburg as you can from D.C. Yes, sir, I had your hand up on the side there for quite a while. I don't believe McCosey or Nick Macarelli are on it. I, I can't say for sure. You'd have to go online and look, but it doesn't jump out at me that... Bernie O'Neill is not on it, as far as I, as far as I know. No. I don't have every one of them memorized. I've got 72 Republicans on, so I can't memorize all 72 that are on. So you'll have to go online and check. You can contact my office. We can point you to the right link to check it out. Um, or Steve can probably help you get to the right link if you contact Steve, and he, he can get it from my office and share it with, the, with whoever's here. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't have everybody memorized, but I know Steve Barrar was, like I said, I know John Lawrence was, because John and I talked about his support, and uh, I know Paul Clymer has been, Paul's been a great ally in the Second Amendment. I know he came down and talked to you all, and Paul's been pushing the rally I have annually for a number of years and getting the information out to people. Yes, sir. Right. I mean, that's a great question because certain areas of the state are more problematic than others as far as the DAs who are prosecuting the judges. You know, we, we've had a problem with Philadelphia on, on tort reform issues over the years where there's more frivolous lawsuits that are, that are granted, which drive up our costs across the state for everybody. Um, we've had our problem, of course, with, as you said, the revolving door. Um, we've tried to put mandatory uh, sentences in place. Of course, they plea bargain some of those, man those, those charges away early on many times. Um, you know, you have some very liberal judges. I mean, ultimately, the accountability comes through the voters, and, uh, and that's, that's our ultimate accountability to the elected officials is, is the voters. Although, you know, we can impeach certain individuals, and we don't, the legislature doesn't use the impeachment tool near enough, both at the federal and state level, and, and we need to get that back, and citizens need to demand that comes back. I, I think we should just throw a name in a hat, pick a judge, <laughs> impeach them. We can find a reason most with all of them, just to show we can do it. You know, and then you strike fear into every one of the other judges, and you know that, hey, if this guy.